This morning's service is in a sense a preparation for this evening's. And since the baptistry is open and you know what's going to happen tonight, that needs no explanation. And I want to take a rather dull and unpopular subject this morning, the matter of obedience. It's a word that is dropping out of our language. If you study the hymns that have been written over the last 25 to 30 years, you don't find a hymn that uses the word obey. And the hymn we've just sung is much older than that. The days have gone when a bride promised in a marriage service to love, honor, and obey her husband. Princess Margaret tried to reverse the trend by putting the words back into her marriage, but it doesn't seem to have halted the drift. And this simple question of obedience, it's not a very glamorous word, it's not a very exciting subject, but somebody once said to me that the secret of success in the Christian life is to be found in this one word, obedience. Furthermore, I am often questioned on the matter of guidance. How do you get guidance from God? How do you know what he wants you to do? Well, one of the things one has got to say is this. If you are already doing what you know he has told you to do, you will find that he will give you the next step. But there will be a blockage <coughs> in the channel of guidance if you are not already doing something he told you to do. In other words, I cannot expect God to tell me the next step if I am refusing to take this one. And so that's why I've chosen the subject. I want to approach it from two angles. On the one hand, the obedience of Christ. And on the other hand, the disobedience of every one of us. Take the obedience of Christ. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I'm looking back to yesterday and looking at his obedience when he was on earth. Of many things that I could pick out, I pick out only five, one of which occurs in the very first glimpse we have of Jesus as a boy. And I want you to notice in the reading we had first about that wonderful little story of a boy of 12 upsetting his parents because they couldn't find him. There's something terribly human about this. And a mother really letting off her feelings of relief by telling him off quite roundly and soundly when he's discovered again. In that little story, you see something that goes right the way through to the end of his life. And that something is obedience. First glimpse of the boy we have. And it states the most remarkable thing that from that incident he came back to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents. Now the two remarkable things about that statement are these. A boy of 12 was no longer under any obligation to be obedient. Now we have the age of, or coming of age of 21. I think it'll soon drop to 18. And we shall start having 18th birthday parties instead of 21sts. Because 21 seems to be a little too far on for most youngsters today. But in giving the key of the door... As a symbol of coming of age, we are saying, from now on you come in when you decide, you don't come in when we decide. You are now responsible for your own decisions. We release you from the obligation to be in by 10.30 or whatever it's been up to then. Here is the key of the door. Now the Jewish boy was given the key of the door at 12. He came of age at 12 and from then on, he was released from the obligation to do everything he, his parents told him. And the amazing thing is that after 12, it says Jesus came back to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents. In other words, it was now a voluntary and not a compulsory obedience. Jesus was saying, I still respect you and therefore I will show it by still doing what you say is best. That is a very remarkable thing and a complete contrast to one young lady I had. 
shouting at her parents and stamping her feet and saying, just you wait until I can get a job and get enough money and I'm going into digs. I'm going to have a flat with someone. I'm going to get away from you. Jesus came down to Nazareth after he'd come of age and became obedient to them. The other remarkable thing is, of course, that Joseph was not his father. And therefore, Joseph had no authority over him. And Jesus knew that he was not his father. This is the surprising thing. Mary said, your father and I have been worried stiff about you. And Jesus said, my father, my father is God. And I've been with my father. In other words, Joseph, you have no authority over me. You're not my dad. But he came back to Nazareth and he was obedient to both of them. This is the remarkable character of Christ's obedience. There is not a trace of wanting his own rights. There is not a trace of saying, I will go my way, I want to be my own boss. Not a trace of it. The second remarkable demonstration of this is his baptism. Now occasionally people say to me, well I think you can be a Christian without being baptized. And one has to say that is a possibility. I have many, many friends in the Salvation Army, for example, and some among the Quakers who are not baptized. But let's look closely. I hope this doesn't sound a bit irreverent or even rude, but if ever anyone could say, I can be a Christian without being baptized, it was Christ. He was the first Christian in that sense. Because he was the first Christian, he was the Christ. And if anybody could have said, I don't need to be baptized, I can be a Christian without this, he could have said it. But when he came down to the Jordan River, that dirty, muddy river, where his cousin was preaching and baptizing, he said to his cousin, will you baptize me? And his cousin said, no fear. You don't need this. I need it, he said, you'd better baptize me, which showed that the first Baptist was not baptized. Did you ever realize that? That's why he was less than the least in the kingdom of God, or one of the reasons. But he said, you should be baptizing me. And do you know what Jesus said? It is right for us to do whatever God has commanded. That's the New English Bible translation. It is right for us to do whatever God has commanded. In other words, it is not an optional extra. It's not something you do if you like it or feel like it. If God has said be baptized, then you are baptized whether you feel you need it or not. It's a simple matter of do I obey or do I not? And Jesus said baptize me and he did. And when a person is baptized in these waters here, they know that they are obeying Christ and doing what he did in obeying God. And they know also that what God said about Jesus when he did this is what he says about them when they do this. With you I am well pleased. Now the second thing in which his obedience comes out is in the matter of what followed his baptism, the temptations. I want to spend a much fuller time on these on a later occasion. But let me say that you won't understand the temptations unless you approach them through the mind of the devil rather than the mind of Christ. And ask the question, what was Satan after? What was Satan trying to do to him? What was the temptation all about? Because the temptations came from the mind of Satan, not the mind of Jesus. What was Satan trying to get him to do? The answer is very simple. Disobedience, that's all. And everything Satan could use to try and get Jesus to disobey his father was used. And the three things he tried were these. First of all, he offered him a pleasure of the flesh. Jesus was hungry and the devil said, disobey God and use your miraculous power to feed yourself. He offered him the popularity of the world and said, if you want a big crowd, you better do it this way. If you want them to think highly of you, do it this way. And then he offered them the power of the devil. Said, I can give you all the power in the world if you'll just let me be your boss. Now these three temptations were utterly simple temptations. Pleasure of the flesh, popularity of the world, and the power of the devil. And Satan said, I'll give you any of these three things if you'll disobey God. 
And Jesus again and again went to the one book in the Bible that's about this matter of obedience, the book of Deuteronomy. It's the one book that pushes this matter home again and again. Obey, obey, obey. There's no other way. And Jesus quoted this book back at him. And the devil limped off into the wilderness a broken person. Well now, the third example of our Lord's obedience comes out in his teaching. And again and again he said something like this. I quote from two occasions. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And again, I seek not my own will but the will of him who sent me. And on his lips it doesn't sound pious. And it doesn't sound hollow and it doesn't sound hypocritical. It's a simple fact that Jesus had no ambition whatsoever for himself. Now we're going to have a discussion soon with the young people on should a Christian have ambition? And without jumping the gun and prejudicing that discussion, it's quite clear that Jesus had no ambition for himself whatsoever. But he did have a tremendous ambition to do God's will and to do what God wanted him to do. Tremendous ambition. And so he said again and again, this is what I have come to do. Now the fourth way in which it comes out, or the fifth way rather, and the supreme way is in his death. I remember reading a most dramatic true incident in the Second World War in which an officer of the army was giving an order in the lack of full knowledge which meant the certain death of those to whom he gave the orders. And the men knew it. And the men knew that if they obeyed this officer's order, they would be dead within the day. But the officer gave it. And the men obeyed it. I suppose this is about the final test you could give of obedience and discipline. And we're told in the Bible that Jesus kept up this obedience and knew all the time that it was going to lead to an early death at the age of 33. But he kept it up. Come with me now on a little mental pilgrimage into the last few weeks of our Lord's life. Into three stages of it. Number one, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That was an act of obedience. Even his dearest friends said, don't do it. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Come with me into the upper room. And here is Jesus praying the last night of his earthly life. And he's praying. Listen to what he says in the prayer. He says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. And I sanctify myself. In other words, I set myself apart to keep it up until the bitter end. Come with me into the garden of Gethsemane. I have never sweated drops of blood. I have never been under such agony. But out of that agony Jesus said, Not my will but thine be done. And when we pray the prayer thy will be done, it is not an expression of resignation but of resolution. The emphasis is on the word done, not on the word will. Some people say, oh, well, God's will be done. In other words, something has happened which they can't alter, and so they accept it with resignation. But when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven by the angels. And it's a tremendously activist, not a passive phrase. Thy will be done. And Jesus went to do it. Well, now, was there a secret behind this obedience? Yes, there was. And the secret was this. Jesus loved God. You will never obey someone as implicitly as he did until you love them as much as he loved his Father. And later Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will do what I say. In other words, it's not simply a question of obedience. It's a question of love. And if somebody says, should I be baptized? Well, I would say the first question is obedience. And if you hesitate over that, then you must move on to the next question. How much do you love him? 
If you love me, you keep my commandments, he says. And behind his obedience to God was his love for his father. And behind his disciples' obedience to him was their love for him. And behind our obedience to anyone, if it's a voluntary obedience, there must be a deep, deep love. For the first time in history, I suppose, God got what he wanted from a man. For the first time in history, a heavenly father could look at a son on earth and be glad that he was obedient. Now I ask my three children at breakfast time, can I tell them in the sermon that I have the joy of three obedient children? And they said, no. <laughs> they have honesty at least. <laughs> That's one virtue. <laughs> it's a rare joy. Not to find a cowed child who is forced to do good and does it reluctantly because the parent has to shout at them. It's a rare joy to find a child who loves parents enough to want to obey, to believe that the parents don't tell them to do a thing because it's silly or wrong, but because it's best and right, to believe that obedience brings joy and peace. Now, God was a heavenly father who had a gigantic family on earth, and not one of them until Jesus was born had ever given him this kind of obedience, not one. But when Jesus came, the Heavenly Father said, Now I've got a son that I can rejoice in. Now I've got a son with whom I am well pleased. Now I've got a son who will do things whether he thinks he need do them or not, because I have told him to do them. Now I have a son who will go the whole way, even if it costs death, because I say so. And that's the secret of Jesus' joy and peace. Now against that background, of course, our disobedience shines up very clearly. Let me first of all take our disobedience as a corporate thing, as a group, as a race, as nations, and then come down to the individual level. First of all, as a race. Now, another word in the Bible for sin is trespass. And there's something about a notice saying trespassers will be prosecuted, especially uh, in connection with little boys, that makes you want to climb that fence. And I've done this before, and so have you. Trespassers will be prosecuted. Okay, meet you on Thursday night. We'll go, go into that wood. You understand the word trespass. And when you said, as you said this morning, forgive us our trespasses, you mean precisely what it says. Forgive me for going into forbidden territory, for climbing over the fence that you've erected, now, I'll tell you the result of ignoring such fences and especially removing them. In the middle of Manchester, there used to be a park, a garden, surrounded by iron railings. And every night, the gate was shut and padlocked, and the iron railings kept people out, and it was a lovely little garden that you could go into. It was well kept, and people enjoyed it. It was a little oasis, and if you know Manchester, you'll know what... A value that was. But not only did boys climb over the fence at night and do things inside the garden they shouldn't have done, but when the war came, the railings were taken away, as probably some of yours were, to make shells and guns. And the fences came down. And if you go to that garden today, you will just find a sea of mud, of rusty tins, of rubbish, and there is no <coughs> garden left. Now, at the beginning of the history of our race, God put God in a garden, and he put up a notice against one tree, trespassers will be prosecuted. And with all the other trees in the garden and all the other beauty and enjoyment of it, they just had to go and touch that. The history of the human race begins with an act of disobedience. And if you want to know what's gone wrong with our race, there's the answer. It can be put in one word, disobedience. Let me look at Israel for a moment. It's a nation that I find fascinating. I just can't keep my mind off Israel. God's barometer, Israel. If you want to know what the weather's like, if you want to know what the state of history is, then watch God's barometer, Israel. They were given by God a land, lovely little land. 
They were given a name, a name that's lasted 4,000 years. They were given a nation. They were given privileges that no other nation has ever had. So that it does not matter what sphere of life you mention, a Jew is somewhere near the top of it. If you mention money, music, architecture, philosophy, science, you'll find a Jew near the top of it. What privileges they've had. But shall I tell you this? No nation has been more disobedient to God than this one. And their history and the, the appalling story of the persecution and the difficulties and the dispersion that they've had can be summed up in one word, disobedience. When they came out of Egypt, they were so glad to get the chains of slavery off their wrists and ankles that they said, and I quote their exact words, all that the Lord says we will do. But it's easy enough to say that when you're just in a, a real crisis. A man once came to me and he said, uh, look, he said, in the middle of the war, I was in the middle of a battlefield. And he said, I was in danger of losing my life. And I said, God, if there is a God, if you get me out of this and get me back home to my wife and family, I'll just do whatever you want me to do for the rest of my life. He got back home to his wife and family, but he didn't do what God wanted him to do. And bless him, he came that night. He's an engineer in a factory, and he came that night, and he said, can you have a second bite at the cherry? And I just told him quite simply, of course you can. God is a God of mercy and he loves to give you a second chance. But you don't come on the basis, I will do whatever you tell me. You come on the basis, will you do for me what I need? And will you make me what I ought to be? That man now is now a radiant Christian, influencing others in his factory and worshipping God. He promised to be obedient when he was in the crisis, but when he got out of it, it just frittered away. And even in the wilderness, the Jews disobeyed. The first victory over Jericho, when they came into the promised land, they disobeyed and touched things they shouldn't have done that God told them not to touch, and therefore the next town defeated them. And their whole history is a history of disobedience. Their greatest king, a man after God's own heart, broke four of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. David and Bathsheba, you know the story. He lied, he coveted, he killed, he committed adultery, all in one fell swoop. There are people who think that God has added a little note at the bottom of the Ten Commandments which says candidates need only attempt six out of ten. I don't know where we got this idea, but when God tells us what to do, he doesn't say, do what you can. That's a death sentence. A man of 60, I'm told, I'm not sure if this is true, I'm almost sure it isn't, but a man of 60 was supposed to be sent to jail for life, 21 years. And he said, I'll never make it, I'll never make it, I'm an old man and, and I'll never make it. And the governor of the jail is supposed to have said to him, well, never mind, do what you can. <laughs> That's about the good news or the bad news of saying to a person, here is God's will, do what you can. Because when God gave the Ten Commandments, he gave them as a complete chain of character and if you break one you've broken the lot if you break a link in God's chain you break the whole thing you have broken the law and that's why the New Testament says if you've only broken one point you've offended the whole because it's a whole it's not a lot of little bits that you do it's the will of God the total will of God for your life and we are called to be obedient we are told in the Bible that towards the end of history we will experience a growing spate of disobedience in three respects. Disobedience to parents will increase towards the end of history. Now let me get this in perspective. About a hundred years ago, an archaeologist digging in the sands of Egypt dug up a little scrap of paper and it proved to be the oldest piece of paper in the world by tests on it they discovered it was the oldest piece of paper that's ever been discovered and it was part of a personal letter from one woman to another so she had the first word well now she was writing this letter and on this little scrap do you know what it says it says I don't know what things are coming to children are no, no longer obedient to their parents and that goes back about five or six thousand years 
So I'm not going to get this out of perspective and say, aren't the days terrible? I'm sure I was never as bad as this. <laughs> but you know, my memory fades a bit, <laughs> and so does yours. But we are told that at the end of history, there will be very, very little obedience to parents. Secondly, we are told that towards the end of history, there will be very little obedience to public authorities. Very little. Now, lest you think that we are excused from that, what about the traffic laws? I won't say it, but hands up those who never go above 30 miles an hour. I can't put my hand up. Tax laws, petty pilfering, a manager of a small branch of a supermarket told me that he has allowed £2,000 a year for shoplifting and anything above that has to come out of his salary and he has a terrible job keeping it down to that. And £30 million worth a year stolen from our self-service stores in Britain shoplifting. We're told that there will be an increasing disobedience to authority. And we're told that at the end of history there will be an increasing disobedience to God. This is what we are to look forward to. Now within that situation, let's have a good go at the world and say, I don't know what things are coming to, but let's be honest and let's look at ourselves now. Let's look at the matter of our personal obedience. Our personal obedience to our parents, whatever their age. <coughs> We are told to honor your father and mother. We're not told that that stops when you're 21. You're told to honor father and mother. Isn't it interesting that we learn, learn the words no, shan't, and won't earlier than we learn the word yes and will? Did you know this? If you've had children, you'll know it. What a rare joy. Go and see what John is doing and stop him, said a mother one day. <laughs> Family life. Well, let's not be cynical, but let's remember that the commandment is honor your father and mother. Let's remember that we are called as individuals to obey the authorities, the government, the laws, unless they tell us to do something which is contrary to God's will for us. And then we've got to say we must obey God rather than men. But until we get to that point, we are told to obey. Whether we like the laws or not, whether we agree with them or not, we are told to love, honor, and obey and respect those in authority. But I'm concerned with God. We were recalling over breakfast time a family in our last church who had twins, two uh, children who came to our Sunday school, and they had a take-home book for the Sunday school work which had questions in it which they answered. And they were watching them fill in one day, and they were most interested because it was on obedience. And they were quietly sort of hanging around and looking over their children's shoulders to see what they wrote. Question number one was, did God ever speak to you and tell you to do something? Yes, they both wrote. Question number two, did you do it? The parents were just watching to see what they would write. And they both wrote, yes. Later that evening, about two hours later, when the children, the twins were off to bed and asleep, the parents picked up their homework books for Sunday school and decided to look through to see how they were getting on. And they came to the same page again. And to their astonishment, the second question, the answer, had been changed in both cases. Yes had been crossed out and no had been written in, which uh, again was honest. They'd waited till their parents were out of sight and then answered the question honestly for fear their parents came back at them for saying this. When we're in public, we say, yes, we obey God. In private, perhaps, we better say no and ask God for forgiveness and power. <coughs> there are many ways in which Christians need to be called to simple obedience. Let me first of all deal with the unbeliever in a word. God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Until a man has repented of his sins, he's in a state of disobedience to God. Whatever else he may or may not have done, he may have no vices, no crimes, but if he hasn't repented, he's disobedient. God has now commanded all men everywhere to believe on his son, Jesus Christ. And the one act of disobedience that thousands are doing at the moment is this act of not believing. When God sent his son, did all he could do and they don't believe in him. 
but the believer is the one I'm concerned about. We are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Evangelism is not something that we have to be stirred up to. It's not an optional extra. It's a fundamental part of the Christian life. It's a matter of obedience. But let me now come to tonight's service. Tonight we are going to do two things. We're going to baptize people in this water. We're going to have bread and wine on that table and we're going to eat and drink. Why? Because we're Baptists, no. Because somebody thought of doing these things and it seemed quite a good idea, no. Because the people who will be doing this like doing it by nature, no. Why do we do it? You may notice that we don't use the word sacraments as much as other Christians may seem to do. But we use another word, a rather important word. We describe these two things as ordinances. And that word means orders. Why do we take bread and drink wine? Because Jesus said, do this. Not if you feel it will help. He said, do this. And if I love Jesus, I do it. It's as simple as that. Mind you, he blesses me when I do it. Hallelujah, he adds to obedience blessing. But why do I do it? To get the blessing? No. Because he said, do this, and if I love him, I do it. Why are they going to be baptized? Because they want blessing? Well, I'm sure the Lord will bless those who are being obedient in this matter. But why are they doing it fundamentally? And I have emphasized this in the classes. You do it because he said, do this. It is a, an act of obedience. We're showing our love for the Lord by doing what he told us to do. Could anything be more simple than that? Jesus once told a parable, the shortest one he ever told. It's two sentences long. And I suppose it's the most important parable or story he ever told. This was the story. A certain man had two sons. And he said to one, do this. And he went away and did not do it. And he said to the other, do this. And the other said, no, I won't. And went away and did it. Now that's the shortest parable Jesus ever told. But I think it's the most profound. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let us pray. <clears throat> Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. Thy gracious aid afford. Teach me thy way. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, who became obedient even unto death. Amen.